Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the AVC lecture series. Um, I would like to talk about our nearest star, the sun, today. First of all, I'm sorry to, you know, bother you in a sunny uh, afternoon. I'm sure uh, most part of India, it's very hot and uh, you will be missing your uh, afternoon nap. So, uh, but we thought, you know, the other days people are busy with a lot of uh, online classes. So I will use this opportunity to, uh, you know, share my excitement about what we do. So uh, the idea is that uh, I will try to give you a glimpse of uh, this uh, object called the sun. And the background image, what you see, is uh, a multivalent image of our nearest star. I should also acknowledge that the, the, the slides and the content which I've been using are taken from many different resources, uh, many websites from NASA and ESA missions, and also several solar colleagues, uh, they have been giving talks here and there, so I borrow some of the slides uh, from them as well. So you also see an eclipse picture in the background. Uh, I won't have time to talk about uh, eclipses today, but uh, there is one which is coming in uh, next month. This is not the total solar eclipse, but uh, we will be watching it from Nainital. So again, uh, greetings from uh, Nainital, Aries, and let's uh, talk about the sun. The sun, like uh, all stars, is a dynamic star. It's always active always changing and more we learn about it more we learn about the other stars because this is the nearest star so, this movie should play automatically there so this is a movie uh, file taken from a extreme ultraviolet uh, uh, telescope of uh, solar dynamic observatory and uh, you see the uh, object very bright on the screen there is called the active region and yeah so should we be able to this should play automatically yeah we have certain issues with uh, with files it looks like okay so uh, this is a very uh, you know bright region in the sun which is called the active region and it is taken from extreme ultraviolet uh, telescope uh, in the one of the NASA missions. Sun is a normal star. It is a middle-aged main sequence star of spectral type G2. You need not worry too much about uh, these jargons, but basically the stars are formed from interstellar medium and uh, they go through a life cycle and uh, Sun is it is middle-aged. So it's a it's a normal star, but it is the only star on which we can resolve the spatial scale on which fundamental processes take place. This is a very important uh, statement because majority of the object what we see in the sky uh, are observed as a point object. So we really cannot see the details on the surface of those objects. Sun being very close to us, it allows us to see much more details on its surface. So it is, of course, a special star because it provides almost all the energy to the Earth. Our existence is uh, because of Sun at an appropriate distance away from us. Also, Sun is a very special star because it provides us with a unique laboratory in which to learn about various branches of physics. This is a very important element because uh, I am targeting uh, the undergraduate or early postgraduate students and they are uh, engaged in studying primarily physics and what we do in, uh, in our later career in astrophysics is nothing but different branches of physics which is applied. So I would like to uh, give a you know essence of what are different branches of physics you can you know sort of apply while studying solar physics. There are several uh, boxes here the circles I, if I just point out, you know, we know that the nature is very turbulent and uh, we also know magnetic field plays a crucial role in controlling a lot of dynamics and ma magnetic field is generated by a process called dynamos. And what we understand today that, uh, you know, in the sun, 
the magnetic fields also get generated through a process called dynamo. So if you want to understand the generation mechanisms of magnetic field and uh, the nature of uh, chaos and, and so on, Sun provides you an ideal laboratory. Then we also know that in the universe, 99.9% of the matter is actually in the plasma state. Um, most of you are familiar with uh, different you know, states of matter. And when the temperature goes to very, very high beyond uh, gaseous state, then it becomes a combination of electrons and, and uh, neutrals and charged particles and so on. That is called the plasma state. And majority of the universe is actually in the plasma state. So if you want to study the plasma physics, then again, uh, Sun provides the ideal laboratory. The problem of uh, standard laboratory setup is sometimes you are restricted by the sizes of you know what kind of experimental setup you can have of very high say temperature or uh, very low density and so on. So there is a, always a restriction on a terrestrial environment or, or in earth to set up such a laboratory. In the astrophysical scenario we have a natural laboratory and the, the best one is the sun which is closest to us. So if you want to verify some of the plasma physics, uh, your understanding or theory, uh, Sun provides again an ideal laboratory. Similarly, there are several branches uh, of atomic and molecular physics of different transition of, uh, of uh, elements and, uh, and how different spectral lines are formed. So all these can be studied uh, very well in the context of Sun. There are also uh, famous, uh, you know, discoveries in terms of even uh, even particle physics, the fundamental problems with uh, the understanding about the fundamental particle, the neutrinos. It was believed that the neutrinos do not cause any mass. But then uh, through some experiments from Sun, it was uh, later on, uh, you know, found out that neutrinos can also have different flavors and so on. There were famous uh, gravitation experiment uh, performed during the total solar eclipse which again uh, allowed us to verify certain theories of Einstein's and so on. Again, Sun being a, a normal star and close to our, us, uh, it allows us to study this evolution of the star. And there are many, many stars which are Sun-like stars. If you want to understand how those stars evolve with time, what are the engineered structure of those stars, what are the kind of atmosphere of those stars, then again, uh, sun provides you an ideal platform. Similarly, these days uh, we are also very much interested about you know uh, planetary systems uh, uh, other than uh, our own, and in that context, the you know study of the solar planets, the extrasolar planets, and so on uh, provides a key. There are also studies about uh, cosmic rays. This again provides you a, a very new uh, avenue. There is a, one new branch which has been becoming very important in recent uh, decades uh, is highlighted here which is called the Sun-Earth relation. Because now we understand that our existence here is primarily because of the presence of the Sun as at an appropriate uh, distance away. Now if Sun is uh, doing something you know very dynamic or something goes wrong uh, or whatever amount of radiation it is coming from the Sun, if it changes then it will directly affect our, our atmosphere and mainly the climate as well. So there are two type of uh, changes in our, our, so our Earth atmosphere can happen. One is the short term, which we call it as a space weather. I will shed some more light in the later half. What is uh, space weather? Basically, we need to know what is the you know, environmental conditions in between the Sun and Earth uh, interplanetary space. And there is also another important uh, aspect namely our climate, because we are all bothered, bothered about, you know, with the industrializations and so on, our uh, you know, global warming and so on, you know, the climate, the pattern is, uh, seems to be changing. Is it sun also some way responsible for this? This is a very important aspect, a combination of uh, the solar radiation uh, output and our environmental, local environmental changes makes uh, the main driver for the climate change. So uh, we do study on those uh, elements as well. So the other context is how does this solar physics, one of the oldest branches of astrophysics, uh, you know, link with the, with the other uh, major astrophysical uh, studies. So phenomena happening all over the universe 
Can we best study at close distance where the relevant physical processes can be spatially resolved? Same as also for solar planets. So I'm again re-emphasizing the importance of solar physics in the context of astrophysics. I mean, as I mentioned that I uh, do, uh, you know, uh, solar physics, so obviously I will have my own uh, preference uh, and also would like to uh, motivate people to understand that, you know, sun does provide a, a good opportunity uh, to uh, study the astrophysics as well. There are different activities. Uh, I will briefly mention about this uh, today that the sun possesses a lot of magnetic field and that magnetic field changes with time in a short time scale and also long time scale. And now we understand the magnetic activity uh, are present in innumerable stars in, in other uh, you know, astrophysical uh, scenarios as accretion disks, in jets, in interstellar medium. But the relevant physical uh, spatial scale can generally be not resolved. As I mentioned earlier also, that uh, since these objects are far away from us, often we can't find the finer details in, inside those structures. So sun does provide a key for this. And also there are many branches of uh, astrophysics which uh, uh, actually initially been uh, studied for sun. Primarily the radio astronomy, there is radiative transfer, there is a technique called spectropolarimetry. These are again uh, a little uh, you know, technical terms, but I wanted to again emphasize the fact that uh, solar physics being one of the oldest branches of astrophysics, it allowed uh, us to test many new techniques which uh, was first applied to uh, the solar observations and then uh, later on it was applied to other branches of physics. So the sun is located uh, where the sun is in, in the context of our galaxy, is located in the spiral arm of our galaxy as you see so-called Orion arm, this red mark is the location of uh, our sun. Sun orbits the center of the Milky Way in about 225 million years. Then the solar system has a velocity of 230 kilometers per second. And uh, our galaxy consists of about 100 billion other stars. And there are about 100 billion other galaxies. So today, I'm only talking about the sun. So think about how many objects are there in the sky and uh, how many people we need to really uh, know uh, in detail about all these objects. There are thousands of people working on the sun with just one of these stars in this entire plethora. The sun has inspired mythology in many cultures, including the ancient uh, Egyptians, the Aztecs, the Native Americans, Indians, and the Chinese. We studied them for many, many centuries. Sun is uh, 330,000 uh, times more massive than the Earth and contains 99.86% of the mass of the entire solar system. So you can imagine in this many body system, how much massive the sun is. All other objects are really, really, really tiny. So the, you know, the center of mass of this many body system is very, very close to inside the sun only. So this is an important element we should you know, uh, keep in mind. The sun, as I mentioned, you know, is a middle-aged star. So there are certain uh, reactions happens inside the star, which uh, makes the star shine. This is called the hydrogen burning. So it consists of about 78% hydrogen which gets converted into helium and there are some 2% of other elements at this stage. If sun becomes very, very old, uh, several million and billion years later, these composition numbers will change. The total energy radiated is 100 billion tons of uh, TNT per second. This is again a unit. Uh, it's like, you know, you can imagine if there is a hydrogen bomb, uh, there are 100 billions of uh, hydrogen bomb exploding inside the sun, you know, every second. So let's look at the inside the sun now. Of course, what we see in the sky is the surface of the sun. We cannot see inside the sun because it's like a plasma blob. So by different methods, we have now some understanding about the internal structure. Uh, as I mentioned that uh, there is a core right into the middle of the sun uh, in the center. We have this nuclear energy uh, where nuclear reactions burn every second about 700 million tons of hydrogen into helium. Then we have uh, this, uh, this uh, you know, radiative zone 
Uh, although the photons travel at the speed of light, they bounce so many times through the dense material that there is about a million years to escape from the sun. And you see here inside, these, you know, these are called the random walk. It's like a drunkard person moving around and it gets collided uh, with another, uh, you know, uh, person and then uh, bounces back and so on. So that's the sort of, you know, 30% uh, inside, which is called the radiative zone. And then we have the convection zone. So energy is transported by convection just like a boiling, boiling soup where heat is transported to the photosphere. So here you see that the last 30% inside the sun you have uh, a, something called a convection zone and that's a very very important layer inside. It's very similar to, to as I mentioned here that like a boiling soup. I mean you start uh, you know uh, putting the soup on the, on the heater you will see after some time there is a convection sets in and the you know material goes up and then the lighter material goes down and that sets the convection. And inside the sun, exactly that's what happens. And we see a signature of that. Now, astronomical subjects again has a lot of link with, uh, with history, the development of science, the physics, uh, the philosophy. And uh, we must point out that this is a gentleman who really changed our views of the society and also how we do science today. Uh, he faced a lot of difficulties in his uh, personal life, but he still kept on, you know, doing, uh, you know, uh, great work. And now we understand, even for the sun, you know, he looked at the, uh, this uh, nearest star very carefully and made several discoveries. So in a way back, uh, more than 400 years back, uh, he used one of the just invented telescope, and he was the first person to record the path of sunspots. So these are these you know, a small little dirt, what you see on the surface. This is actually an animation taken from his hand drawing. So Galileo Galileo looked at the sun through this telescope. He looked at the images uh, and then he drew with hand the positions of these dirts on the surface of the sun. With a surprise, what he observed that if he, if he compares a, a, a image of a sun in one day and the subsequent day, he finds that this particular object which is here today, next day it moves to there. So that means, you know, the sun is also rotating. So these are the two things which uh, he noticed. One was that these are the objects uh, called, uh, of course he didn't know at that time, it was called sunspots. And these are very strong magnetic field regions on the sun. But he noticed that sun is rotating around its own axis and he talked about solar rotation as well. Now, if I go for a closer look of this dirt, which uh, 400 years back uh, Galileo saw, and now I zoom at that portion, the dark blob on the sun, and I look at it closely, it reveals incredible complexity. In the most close-up view, you see this cellular pattern uh, outside this black blob. This black blob is uh, uh, the sunspot, concentrated magnetic field region, but outside you see this cellular pattern. This is nothing but the convection pattern because underneath there is a convection. If you now recall your, you know, boiling soup, you will see when uh, the soup starts boiled, uh, you know, it will have this kind of network pattern or cellular structure. So this is a direct manifestation of convection underneath the sun. And now with the more modern telescopes, this is an image taken from a ground-based solar telescope in La Palma, uh, Swedish uh, solar te te telescope, uh, which is only a one meter size telescope. I will show you pictures later on, which is even bigger than you can imagine how much further details what we can see today. So how does this sunspot uh, come on the surface? Sunspots, now we understand are magnetic structures that emerge from the beneath the surface. So from the underneath the surface, what is happening is these white lines represent the magnetic field lines. So they're like, you know, magnetic tubes. If you, if you consider a rubber tube and try to insert it in a bucket of water, what happens? The rubber tube is actually lighter than the surrounding and it starts, uh, you know, rising up. So here also that's, uh, that's what happens here in this, uh, you know, animation. 
it shows uh, th these are the sunspots. These are always comes in pair. This is again one more the interesting aspect because as you know, magnetic field lines, they start from one polarity and then they go to another polarity. So these are the flux tubes which are coming from underneath and then they emerge out and then they form this structure. But there's one more thing happens that, you know, when these lines are twisted and then they are uh, sort of break apart, then it creates a huge explosion on the sun as well. So these are called solar storms. I will come to these uh, you know, later, uh, but these animation provides you an overview how the sunspots are formed. As you see here, the sunspots are always in a, in a pair and they are dark concentrated magnetic field regions. So one polarity is here and then the north polarity goes out and then the south polarity is connected by magnetic field lines. If you could recall your bar magnet picture, always uh, you know you have a north pole and the south pole and they are connected by magnetic field lines. So this is what exactly happens in the sun as well. This is again a closer view of a sunspot. This is again an observation from the same Swedish shower telescope. And as you can see, how much detail, uh, you know, observations we have. We have, uh, you know, a very close look about this internal structure of the sun or the, the, or the sunspot. This is called Amra. And then the outer part of the sunspots is called Penumbra and so on. And outside, what you see again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, you know, this is a direct manifestation of a convection, the cellular pattern. Uh, uh, shows you this, uh, you know, uh, this granulation, which we uh, call it on the surface of the sun as granulation. So now this is just a snapshot uh, of a of again a full disk solar image. What has happened uh, happened is the earlier image which I showed you was a, uh, is an image of a sunspot taken from a one meter class telescope. Now outside these sunspot regions, sun is primarily quiet. There's not that many strong magnetic field regions used to be understood earlier, but now I will demonstrate today that nothing is actually quiet in the sun. So here, this is a, a, a image taken from the Dickest telescope. This is a four meter class. This is the largest solar telescope uh, very recently uh, you know, inaugurated in, in, in US, in Hawaii, and they are showing us incredible, you know, details about the quiet sun. Again, you see this cellular pattern, but you see there are much more complexity in the cellular pattern, and you see small, small little white patches here. Actually, now what we know is these white little patches are also uh, magnetic field regions, but they're much, much tiny in size as compared to the sunspot. But they do also evolve with time, and they have a lot of uh, role to play in terms of controlling the dynamics in the atmosphere of the sun. I will get back to again to the subject of solar rotation. As Galileo pointed out or uh, observed that the sun rotates uh, along its own axis. Sun rotates uh, every 27 days or so. Huh? But from this left movie, what you can see here is that, uh, you know, Sun doesn't rotate uniformly. Sun rotates differentially. What it means is different parts of the sun rotate with different speeds. In this particular uh, you know, animation, what you see is that the initially the sun, if you can consider it to have a sort of north-south uh, field alignment, and then if you start uh, rotating the sun differentially, that means the equator is rotating faster than the pole. So these are the polar regions in the sun and this is the equatorial region in the sun. As you can clearly see that the field lines get twisted, they get sheared and so on and so forth. That creates a lot of complexity inside. You can think about that your body, you are standing up and somebody is rotating your tummy at a faster rate than your head. Uh, I don't think it will be a very pleasant exercise. So uh, that's what exactly happens inside the sun. So uh, the sun's tummy, the magnetic field lines in the equatorial region uh, are rotated faster than the pole. And as a result, uh, this is how the magnetic field lines get completely tangled and then eventually they can, uh, they can break apart, they connect, there are a lot of other mechanisms which is happening. Now, this is actually a close-up view of the, the same convection which I showed you earlier. So I will try to differentiate here 
uh, on the sun there are two regions one is called the regions where you see lots of sunspots they're termed as active region and there are regions of the sun historically they were always seen to be quiet because of our lack of observational facilities we were not able to find the details of those layers or those uh, particular region uh, so called quiet region but now i will show that how the quiet region is quite dynamic as well so this is a actually a snapshot of the quiet region and now this also demonstrate it is a combination of a simulation and observation as well in the computer now we try to mimic the conditions of a solar you know interior what we do is we put it in a uh, you know our physics uh, known, known physics equations in a, a in a computer uh, box and let the computer evolve these are called the, the uh, age of the numerical simulations and here nicely you see those convection pattern and here what it is shown is actually these lot this pink uh, regions are nothing but those magnetic field regions they are small small magnetic field uh, generations if you can compare with the dekest image and this simulation you will see that they match pretty well so in our understanding of the physics and uh, putting it in the computer boxes and observations they are actually competing to each other sometimes the theoretical uh, you know simulations are ahead of the observations and vice versa so this is a very interesting aspect in terms of the solar physics as well that uh, there are a group of people who are very fascinated about uh, you know observations and they look at uh, you know finer details on the observed features and then there is a class of people they like uh, playing with computers and they uh, put those uh, you know physical understanding into the computer box and uh, generate the sun so now it's a interplay or a, a nice little fight between the observer and the theoreticians and uh, you know we improve our understanding so that's the you know field uh, we are in as well so the summary is the sun rotates differentially both in latitude equator uh, faster than the pole and depth as well that makes things much more complicated as well we are not going into detail of that but if somebody is interested we can get back to it so the standard value of the solar rotation it is also known as carrington rotation because carrington was the first to uh, coin it uh, uh, it's about 27 degree but again there is another interesting aspect the sun rotation axis is inclined by 7.1 degree relative to the earth's orbital axis so this is called the sun's equator is inclined by you know relative to the ecliptic plane so that makes again a uh, little more complication in terms of the solar observations and calculations and so on so the discovery of solar rotation is again due to galileo galilei and this is the again um, uh, image animations uh, you know prepared from the uh, uh, daily images as drawn by galileo sun is a rotating sphere at that time it was known like that but it is not a, a solid body rotation now we understand much more uh, detail as well now i will uh, come to the uh, atmosphere so we were talking about uh, interior earlier and then we came to the surface let's go into the atmosphere of the sun in this particular plot in the y axis uh, temperature is uh, shown and in the x axis height on the solar surface but again what is a solar surface is uh, not a very clear uh, uh, picture because sun is not a rigid uh, solid body so it's not easy to identify or sort of define what is a solar uh, sur uh, surface it's basically uh, actually determined by the radiation the photon the uh, the, the optical wavelengths uh, you know emission which uh, escapes from the surface is termed as uh, is a photosphere so in this uh, image there is a little bit of thickness in the photosphere also as you see so as you expect that when you go away from the from the sun i didn't talk about too much about the in interior in terms of its temperature structure i will briefly mention later on but basically because of the thermonuclear reaction in the interior the temperature is very high of the order of 10 to the power 7 but then temperature drops as we come to the surface it's about 6000 kelvin so that is what is shown here it is in the log scale in temperature here so as we go into the atmosphere slowly about 500 kilometer or so the temperature drops that's what you expect in, in, in Earth or other planets as well, right? I mean, if you go to, like, you know, I'm sitting in the Nainita, uh, we are in a much more pleasant temperature condition as compared to most of you in the plains. But then, as you go farther higher in the atmosphere, we observe that the temperature goes slightly higher and higher. So these uh, layers is called the chromosphere because during, uh, during eclipse observation more than a century back, 
these were of uh, you know some colors were observed during the first few seconds of a total solar eclipse so that's why they were named as chromosphere and then when the uh, you know the, when the solar disk is completely covered during a total solar eclipse you see the outermost layers of the sun which is called the corona so here in this temperature plot what you see is that the temperature uh, goes high high and then it all goes all the way to the million of degree kelvin this is a real weird mystery how the temperature in the outer atmosphere where actually the density is also very low uh, it's so high it is very difficult to maintain such a high temperature of 10 to the power 6 kelvin without some uh, you know some different mechanism apart from the thermal we know that you know just the thermal processes uh, allows you to heat a certain surface but standard thermodynamics will not be able to explain this high temperature in the corona so this is the call, uh, so called uh, coronal heating problem now i will show you observationally what we do we try to image or observe the different layers of the atmosphere of the sun with different filters basically if you wear different goggles with different uh, you know filters with uh, certain wavelengths only allowed then you are able to probe different heights in the atmosphere so this is a temp uh, you know image taken in the photosphere and you see a pair of sunspot if i go about 1000 km above that uh, surface i go reach a place called lower chromosphere and if I take some image with the calcium kind of filter, then I see this kind of structure. It's the same sunspot pair, but you know, you see this, uh, you know, earlier granulation pattern has become much, much bigger. This is called super granules. I will not talk about much, but if people are interested in chaos and, and uh, you know, uh, 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 those theories, this is again another subject area where people can work. We go further up, little bit about say 1,500 kilometer or so, the same sunspot pair region looks so different. There are so many finer structures what you see here. Huh? You see these kind of elongated structures. So these images are taken with the H alpha filter, which probes, uh, you know, about 10,000 uh, degree Kelvin uh, uh, plasma. And we are seeing much, much, you know, uh, details and finer structures in this upper chromosphere. Now we go further up. And uh, these are images taken from X-rays. As you know, when we increase the temperature of an object, it starts emitting in shorter and shorter wavelength. So the earlier images were taken into the ultraviolet, first in the visible uh, wavelength, then in the ultraviolet, and now we are going into X-rays. So the wavelengths are even shorter. And as you can see here, those uh, sunspots look very different. So what we do today, we look at the sun with different filters as i mentioned to map the solar atmosphere this is a collage uh, you know showing that if we look at through different uh, sunglasses as i mentioned we will be able to probe different heights in the atmosphere here this is a uh, sort of you know collage again from a solar dynamic observatory which has seven different goggles so it's looking at all the way from photosphere this is taken from, you know, uh, as you can see, these are, uh, you know, longer wavelength. And then as you go higher and higher up in the atmosphere, slowly we go from near UV to, you know, to extreme ultraviolet and so on and so forth. So from here to uh, higher up in the atmosphere, it allows us to show, see these images simultaneously also. This is again a beauty of uh, the solar observation now. Solar Dynamic Observatory is taking images every 12 seconds with these seven goggles, full disk images. So you can imagine that we have such details uh, on the so uh, solar different height every 12 seconds. So if there is any dynamics happening, we will know pretty well. This is again a, a, a movie made from uh, SDO. And what you see is, uh, these are called the active region, as I mentioned, the region where there are strong magnetic fields. And these uh, two uh, magnetic uh, regions are again connected by these uh, uh, theoretically constructed flux tubes. But now we see that they appear pretty, pretty similar to our theoretical construction. They look like a loop structures where plasma of high temperature and density are confined. And uh, this is what we call the active region. And this is the actually era of multi-wavelength astronomy. 
So again, uh, now we understand in the universe, you know, uh, most of the objects has many, many different temperature plasma and different plasma temperature emits a different wavelengths. So if you want to have a complete understanding about that, uh, that object, really you need to study them at multi-wavelength. But then again, the question is, how do you study the multi-wavelength? If you are only having telescopes at the ground, you can't really see the X-rays or extreme ultraviolet because fortunately Earth's atmosphere cuts them for saving us, but it is not very good for astronomer. So it's a combination of space missions and the ground-based observation. Ground-based observation still allows you to see certain things with very, very great details because you have a very huge telescope with a lot of, uh, you know, infrastructure and so on. In the space, everything has to be miniaturized. So that's why you need to have uh, small telescopes and with certain limitations. And then again, of course, how much data you can collect, how much data you can download and so on. So it's a actually very, very exciting and interesting aspect how this modern technology is being implemented in the space experiments and how it is combined with the ground experiments. There are a lot of experiments which first get tested at the ground and then, then it is flown into uh, space platform as well. So this is a modern uh, way of doing uh, uh, multi wavelength This is an example, uh, my former student, he did uh, this work, uh, combining data, again from Big Bear Solar Observatory, this is a ground-based telescope, uh, 1.6 meter, one of the largest uh, solar telescopes on the ground, and combining data from uh, space uh, platform. So this is uh, probing the coronal height, and this is probing the lower heights. So as you can see here that he, he was looking at very small scale dynamic, this is the so-called uh, quiet sun and as I was mentioning earlier that uh, in the past uh, we named it an active region because a lot of activity was seen and uh, the rest of the sun was termed as uh, quiet but as you can see if you just look at the quiet region with the sufficient uh, you know uh, capabilities of your uh, of your eye you see much more dynamics here so here in this particular movie the evolution of the magnetic field at the photospheric level is uh, is uh, studied then it's a response at different heights in the atmosphere so this particular 3d uh, uh, panel uh, gives you an impression about how uh, we cut through with the different layers in the atmosphere. And as you can see, there are certain dynamics actually which is happening. There are opposite polarities of blue and red region and they connect to each other and this is a process called magnetic reconnection, which generates uh, outflow of material. This is termed as jets or spicules. And you see those jet-like structures in the chromosphere and its response, how it heats the higher up in the corona and so on and so forth. So this is the modern way of looking at multi-wavelength uh, observations and studying the sun a very close uh, you know uh, distance so this is what uh, is the solar corona i was talking about um, the temperature uh, profile is shown here uh, here this this part corresponds to the solar interior uh, right in the core the solar thermonuclear reactions takes place in 10 to the power 7 as you come to the surface the temperature drops to uh, 6000 kelvin or so and as we go away uh, to the outer atmosphere again sharply the temperature rises and then eventually, you know, the temperature almost uh, maintains at millions of degree Kelvin. So this is a mystery uh, uh, which is uh, still uh, not fully understood. Uh, I've been working with this particular subject uh, for 30 years. We have lots of understanding, but still we haven't been able to solve it completely. But we have learned a lot uh, during these 30 years. So this is called some sense of magnetic carpet. The left panel, what you show, uh, what you see here is the magnetic field concentrations on the full disk. So this is the full disk image on the sun and if you take a full disk uh, magnetogram which maps the locations of the magnetic field on the surface of the sun you will see certain regions uh, this is the uh, active region uh, here there's some problem with this movie here but these are called the active regions and the rest of the sun is called the, uh, the quiet region and here you see again the you know uh, quiet region uh, locations where you see opposite polarities. So, which you see here as a salt and paper, basically uh, that salt and paper corresponds to two different polarities. So, although the active region has very strong fields uh, with uh, much higher size and, and, and concentrations and field strength, quiet sun is actually not very different. Here you see these small little uh, salt and paper, they also have kilogauss field strength. 
Sunspots have several kilo gauss field strength, 2000 to 5000 gauss field strength. These uh, small little, you know, concentrations are also having uh, kilo gauss field strength, but only thing is they're very tiny. So in the past, they were not observed. Only with modern telescopes, we are able to see them. But you see how, how, uh, how dynamic they are. And because of these dynamic uh, behavior of these small little uh, you know, flashes there, what you see, uh, you know, uh, it actually generates certain kind of waves and then it goes higher up in the atmosphere and then it uh, generates, uh, uh, you know, heating and so on and so forth. So the sun's magnetic field is strongly affected by magnetic forces. This is an overall global uh, scenario or view of the solar magnetic field. These are the active regions. They are connected by closed field lines. These are so-called the quiet regions. And when the polar region, you will see these red arrows corresponds to the magnetic field lines emerging from the poles. But magnetic field cannot be, I mean, basically you cannot have a monopole. So magnetic field has to connect somewhere. So now, now the understanding is what it appears as the open field lines in the polar region, eventually probably it will connect somewhere, you know, down to the other polarity, but by very, very long connectivity. So, in general, wherever you have strong magnetic field concentrations like active region, you have closed field lines and the other regions have open field lines. So, this is the general picture of this. If you compare with the Earth's magnetic field, so this is a, a comparison with the Earth's magnetic field, very similar a dipole if you consider that they are there in the center of the Earth and this is the rotation axis as you know that there is a small little inclination between this and what we do is uh, you know, we try to understand the sun's, uh, you know, magnetic field. Unfortunately, the magnetic field, what we can measure on the sun is only on the surface. We actually have no direct measurements of the magnetic field at different heights in the atmosphere yet very convincingly regularly. There are certain work, but it's not really systematic uh, magnetic field measurements in all heights in the atmosphere. So what one does is essentially does some kind of extrapolation. Again, this is theorist, uh, you know, uh, imagination and theorist uh, execution in the computer box. And uh, you generate these kind of uh, magnetic field global structures. And that actually looks uh, pretty, pretty close to what we observe. The right side, these are the observations of extreme ultraviolet coronal loops. So if you compare with these loop structures, and these are theoretically constructed, uh, or, you know, uh, extrapolations, they match pretty well. So this is again another very interesting area where a theoretician and, and an observer can work very closely, hand to hand to hand, you know, and improve their understanding and the models as well. Then the last few uh, minutes, five, ten minutes, I will talk about these explosions which happens in the sun, which is called the uh, uh, storms. When magnetic forces above sunspots become tangled and break apart, violent storms can burst from the sun. And this is the main source of our strongest space weather events. So space weather means in the interplanetary space, some, sometimes there are storms as we happen in our earth, uh, you know, when you go to, uh, to the sea for, for uh, fishing, you know, you uh, first listen to the weather forecast. And now today, if you want to launch a satellite, you need to know whether it is safe to launch the satellite and there is not a storm in the interplanetary space because here is an example of this uh, you know kind of storm in the sun and as you can uh, see here there are all these you know small little dots what you see in this last part of the uh, image of the animation they are actually very highly energetic uh, cosmic rays so and very highly energetic particles as well so these white specks near the end of the clips are protons from the blast heating the spacecraft image so this image is taken from a satellite called soho which is at the lagrange in one point and incidentally i will talk about this uh, in next sunday if you can still uh, stay away from your afternoon nap uh, i will uh, uh, share some of our excitement about our future missions uh, from uh, from india and we'll talk about these uh, subject areas more so solar flares are quick, intense, but uh, smaller explosions than uh, coronal mass ejection. They appear as uh, bright flashes, sometimes followed by a blast of high energy particles that can travel at half the speed of light. Large flares can occur several times a year when the sun is near its peak activity. I have not talked about actually uh, this magnetic activity 
does change with long term as well. This is a subject area called solar cycle. One of my uh, PhD student, uh, Vibhuti, will uh, shed more light uh, with the full uh, lecture in coming weeks. So I will not talk about much, but that's one of the fascinating subjects. Why sun does change over a cycle of 11 years? Sometimes the sun uh, shows up with lots of uh, sunspots, and sometimes the sun doesn't show any sunspot at all. So when there are more sunspots, it's called uh, solar maxima, and when there are uh, less number of sunspots, it's called solar minima. Incidentally, now we are going through the phase of the solar minima. So there are not that many sunspots. If you look, uh, go back, I mean, if you are too excited after my talk and uh, try to look at the sun, you may or may not find uh, many sunspots. But if you are closer to solar uh, maximum activity, you will certainly see a sunspot on the surface of the sun. And this snow clip is radiation from the storm hitting the spa spacecraft, as I mentioned. So because of these... Uh, uh, of these uh, you know, flares, CMEs are large solar storms that can blast out a cloud of billions of tons of particles at over 2 million kilometers per hour. And the smaller ones can occur almost any day. The clouds reach Earth's orbit in one to three days, but only a few of them actually head our way. So here you can see that this is the example of a huge explosion. And then because of these explosion, there is a large amount of coronal material which is uh, dumped into the interplanetary space and if this uh, you know uh, thing uh, uh, comes towards us then it is called the coronal mass ejection so this is an instrument called the coronagraph we block the solar disk and uh, these uh, solar disk uh, you know blocks the solar uh, em emission directly coming from the disk but uh, we can then look at the outer outer atmosphere of the, or really, really outer layers of the sun. Sun is also a source of radiation uh, and storm that we call uh, uh, space weather. And this is again a movie taken from uh, a, a twin satellite called uh, Stereo. And as you can uh, see here, when there is explosion in the sun, and this amount of huge amount of material is uh, thrown into the interplanetary space, and if you, uh, I'm sure you don't, don't like to be here at uh, any time. And uh, uh, if a satellite is actually situated here, when these kind of uh, huge, you know, explosions happen in the sun and this material is thrown into interplanetary space, the satellites can get completely damaged. Actually, every other month there is a commercial satellite which gets uh, damaged by solar storm. This is a reality. We don't come to know about it. A lot of uh, you know, instruments on these uh, satellites get damaged because of these uh, huge explosions on the sun. So uh, now uh, being a solar physicist, actually we have another way of uh, earning some money by doing some uh, forecast. Uh, um, so we can do some forecasting when such an explosion is likely to happen on the sun. And if it does happen on the sun, which direction this particular you know, material is going to travel? If it is traveling away from uh, you know Earth line, there is no problem. But if it comes towards Earth, what are the different impacts? So this is again a, a, a very detailed subject. One of my graduate student, uh, Ritesh, uh, will be talking about it in one of the e lecture series in coming weeks. So I will not take his uh, uh, area. So fortunately, uh, we live in the atmosphere of the sun, basking in its light and warmth, protected by our own magnetic shield. So, I mean, Earth has its own magnetic field, and actually, it's, if you can assume it to be a bar magnet, all these things which is coming through, so this is Earth's, uh, you know, magnetic field, if you can uh, uh, approximate it like this, uh, and it provides these magnetic field lines, it provides a natural shield. So, if anything comes from this direction from the sun, basically, these magnetic field lines get uh, uh, distorted, and as you can uh, see here in this animation, slowly, this magnetic field uh, topology will completely change, it gets squeezed and so on and so forth, but still fortunately it doesn't allow the particle to come through and particularly those who are uh, like uh, us in the in these kind of latitudes, there is no problem at all. The people who are living in the in the poles, closer to the poles and all that, they get uh, affected by these particles. So a solar storm, if it heads our way, it uh, really, you know, can damage, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, properties here. If it can, penetrate 
certain conditions it does penetrate and it can hit uh, you know some of the electrical uh, you know uh, facilities and so on that's again a subject area which is called uh, space weather effect and uh, and my student will be talking about it uh, later on so i'm uh, will try to uh, quickly wrap up so the earth has its magnetic field with north and south poles earth's magnetic field reaches 36000 miles uh, into space and it is uh, again there are a lot of uh, physicists who work on Earth's magnetic field subject areas and uh, it's in, uh, you know, in its different atmospheric layers. Uh, so these are called magnetospheres. So Earth's uh, you know, ionosphere, stratosphere. In fact, incidentally, we do have uh, uh, atmospheric science division in, uh, in Aryabhatta Institute, Aries. So it's a nice combination of study of uh, you know, Earth's atmospheric uh, you know, study along with the solar disturbances. So this is a new field which uh, I think uh, we will be exploring it in recent years uh, quite uh, actively from uh, this institute. So I'm very close to my talk now. So the future of solar physics uh, lies in this uh, next uh, picture. Uh, we uh, occasionally uh, every year, uh, you know, take uh, one month school and we invite a lot of youngsters uh, across uh, the country. And uh, this is uh, 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 notoriously known as Deepu's uh, gang, my students and, and, and postdoc, uh, who are basically continuing all this, uh, you know, what, what I've been talking about today. Uh, incidentally, we wanted to host a, uh, a school this year in March. And uh, unfortunately, because of uh, unprecedented uh, you know, situation, uh, we had to last minute cancel that uh, program. And I was expected to lecture in that uh, particular, uh, you know, school. And I hope uh, some of those students who were, uh, uh, you know, who were likely to attend that school is, uh, is live today and get a glimpse of it. But I must admit, you know, uh, I'm very uncomfortable by sitting in a chair and giving a lecture because I prefer, uh, you know, running around uh, because look, uh, drama because I do uh, perform on stage. Uh, so I feel uh, more comfortable when I can move and uh, you know, interact. So this is uh, that way a little boring to you know, just have a one, uh, uh, you know, one side uh, uh, lecture. But I hope uh, you got some glimpse and the questions are coming, I guess, uh, and uh, my, uh, my students will be uh, sharing with me. So this is an image taken a few hours back uh, from, uh, from just few meters away from this room uh, and with uh, three of my students we are just amazed to look at the sky and somewhere there uh, of course the sun is not there at this point of time but it's part of our Milky Way and uh, would have been there at some other time and in the top panel you see also a panoramic view of the Hanley Observatory uh, incidentally you know I just uh, joined in this institute from the Institute of Astrophysics Bangalore and this Hanley Observatory uh, belongs to the uh, Institute of Astrophysics and I've been fortunate to even uh, go there and spend some time. So essentially I must also like to share that we are very fortunate uh, to be able to you know, carry out our hobbies uh, through our profession. And I think uh, we enjoy what we do and uh, I just wanted to share some of my excitement on the subject with you guys it is much better if when we meet face to face but uh, that is uh, not possible at this moment so we are taking this uh, route so i will then request uh, to show me some of the questions if you can and we'll try to answer those uh, questions as much possible but i would uh, also request uh, you guys to write to me anytime my email address uh, was there you can do a google search also to find my uh, web page or my email address i'll be happy to answer and uh, yeah, i'm reachable always on my phone or uh, whatsapp or whatever so uh, be, please feel free to uh, uh, reach out to me i'll be happy to share i will just now wait for some of the questions okay okay so there are very nice questions to start with <coughs> So the first question is why sunspots are black in color? Very good question. Okay, there are several reasons for this. So essentially, the sunspots are um, are dark as you see in the white light images. The some of the radiations which are coming from underneath the sun 
they are actually blocked by this magnetic field concentrated region. So magnetic field provides a stiffness in the convection. So con uh, the radiation uh, is slightly inhibited in those magnetic regions. So obviously the light which is coming from the uh, from below, if you have a, a blockages somewhere, then you know it's a shot of radiation. There is also actually another factor which makes the sunspot dark. The sunspots are also slightly cooler than the surrounding. So when uh, the temperature is low, the plasma temperature is also slightly lower and that also have an effect in terms of its emission. So I hope uh, that answers your query. So, uh, so the next question is uh, directions of movement is same or not or different parts of the sun? Yeah, so this is again as I indicated uh, in my talk that uh, the di different parts of the uh, sun moves uh, with different uh, speeds. So this is called the differential rotation. So the equator rotates faster than the poles. And uh, that's the number in the surface. And that differential rotation also is actually quite different at the different depth in the sun as well. So that has a very you know, uh, serious consequences uh, about it. Sun rotates on axis. Uh, yes, it does rotate around its uh, own axis. But there is an uh, you know, also interesting aspect that the rotation axis of the sun and the magnetic axis is also not aligned the same way. So that makes also life uh, quite complicated and similar to, to Earth as well. Next question is, uh, which one is hotter, uh, white sun versus red sun? Okay, uh, how did we calculate its temperature? How is it possible one region on the surface is colder than the other. Okay, so uh, yeah, there are two, three elements in this particular question. So the first part is which is uh, hotter at uh, the sun. So as I tried to indicate, of course, the interior of the sun is hotter. Right in the core, there is a thermonuclear reaction where the temperature is 10 to the power 7 Kelvin. And as you come to the surface, the temperature slowly drops to uh, about 6000 Kelvin. And as we go away from the surface of the sun, initially the temperature drops to about say 4,500 Kelvin or so. But then as we go away farther, the temperature again becomes much, much hotter. So this is called the coronal heating. And now we understand there are primarily two different mechanisms which are responsible for this heating. One is called the wave heating. So there are a lot of waves which get uh, you know, generated at the surface or in, in different heights in the atmosphere. And then they, they dump the energy into the higher heights and uh, uh, heat up those atmospheric layer. There is another process called magnetic reconnection, which I did not talk about today at all. This is a conversion of the magnetic energy to heat. Uh, as you have seen from my different uh, animations and all, that the sun's atmosphere is primarily controlled by uh, the magnetic field and its evolution. So it's very dynamic. So uh, because of these you know, interchanges and, and, and connectivity uh, and interactions between the magnetic field, there is a process called magnetic reconnection, whereby the magnetic energy gets converted into heat at different layers in the atmosphere. And that also provides certain uh, heating. Um, so when you say, uh, how did we calculate the temperature? This is a very good point. So normally, temperature for any, uh, any astrophysical uh, you know, object is measured through spectroscopy. So spectroscopy is a field, essentially, we look at certain spectral lines from this emitting plasma. You see, this plasma is at certain temperature. And because of its temperature, there are certain uh, you know, transitions are only allow. So when we look at certain spectral lines by comparing two different spectral lines, taking sometimes their ratio uh, and knowing the atomic physics, we can measure the temperature of the different atmospheric layers. Of course, there is another way of just measuring the temperature of a star, just a integrated star on the photospheric temperature, that's through the black body uh, radiation and so on. I was referring to uh, different atmospheric, you know, plasma uh, temperature measurements through spectroscopy. Okay. Uh, now the next question is, what causes the sun to rotate differentially? This is a very important and different, uh, difficult question because I do not know the answer. 
we all are still uh, trying to understand that why does uh, sun rotate uh, differentially but one thing is there that sun is not a rigid body so if it starts rotating uh, if, if you think about a plasma blob or a you know a very jelly kind structure and you start rotating it actually there is no reason that it will uh, keep its shape also so that way it's not a wonder that sun doesn't rotate uniformly but why sun exactly rotates differentially the way it is is still not fully understood and it's not only uh, you know sun alone there are many other stars uh, you know rotate uh, differentially and since you asked the question this differential rotation has a major role to play uh, for the generation of the magnetic field if you recall one of the animations where i showed because of the differential rotation only this magnetic you know field lines were tangled and then you know having uh, a, you know uh, completely different shapes and then the sunspots were born and so on and so forth so if the differential rotation was not there probably we didn't have the you know uh, magnetic field in the sun as well so it's just not the sun alone now we are, know that there are many stars uh, they rot rotate uh, differentially since you again ask this question there is another very interesting aspects you know the uh, all these stars they uh, they have evolution they uh, they are born from the interstellar uh, medium and then when the star is born initially the the way they rotate is actually very different than the rotation in their middle age so actually sun is uh, rotating slower and slower with age so this is again there are certain un uncertainties or unknown uh, factors still so we do not fully completely understand as compared to other stars uh, what type of study of the sun we do use radio wavelength okay radio astronomy uh, this is a very important question and a very a nice also so as you know the radio astronomy means you know we are looking at much longer wavelength but again uh, when you have a possibility of looking at different wavelength even in the longer wavelength uh, domain you will be able to uh, probe different heights in the atmosphere so through uh, radio imaging you can have big dishes or you can have arrays of antennas and if you can do interferometry that means you know you combine the signals from these different antennas and then synthesize you know uh, these resultant uh, image you are able to actually do imaging also so there is also some spectral uh, you know characteristics can be studied uh, from the sun as well so radio astronomy does provide a completely new window also for the understanding of the solar particularly solar atmosphere okay um, how do we measure the apparent magnitude of the sun again this is a, a standard uh, you know uh, question if you uh, know the black body radiation and if you can measure the uh, the luminosity that is the total radiation of the sun and the distance any star what you need is uh, the distance uh, measurements and with some standard uh, you know uh, candle uh, essentially actually sun provides the candle the reference is actually sun most of the other uh, objects in the sky or other stars are uh, you know compared with uh, with solar uh, you know sort of constants how much emission is coming from the uh, you know radiation from the sun it's called the solar luminosity that actually provides you the scaling of all other objects in the sky why do sunspots fade okay very nice question megha mehta this is a very important and uh, very nice question so as we saw the sunspots are born uh, from underneath these kind of flux tubes which we believe comes out pops up from the surface but there is a property that magnetic field actually diffuses with time as well it is not easy to maintain a magnetic field in your classical electrodynamics or electrostatics we have saw we have studied how a magnetic field is generated so basically changing currents generates magnetic field so uh, unless the you know the circuit is continued you actually do not have a magnetic field here in the case of the sun of course all these different dynamics uh, and the convection that provides this your uh, these movements but that movements it's a interplay between that movement and and the way the magnetic wants to die so the sunspots they will start uh, with certain strength but with time they will disintegrate 
depending on again the sizes and uh, some history some sunspots will leave for a few days some sunspots can leave for for weeks in fact still we do not completely understand very well why certain sunspots actually leave longer than the other there is some uh, understanding that maybe some of these sunspots are actually anchored deeper inside so the ones which are anchored deeper inside they have you know a longer connectivity than the ones which are on the surface so if you have a sunspot which is just generated uh, very locally at the surface or just underneath it will tend to die out sooner than the one which is anchored much deeper but again this is again a, a, a hypothesis because we can't follow the sunspot all the way inside the sun as well there are certain observations now available which allows us to go to certain depth but not to the depth uh, which we would uh, like to know so this is a very very nice uh, question and from a lot of uh, you know statistical work we try to uh, actually address this question why do uh, sunspots uh, uh, you know some fast sunspots fade slower than the other then there is a uh, question by jay lakshmi uh, how the turbulent diffusion leading to backpropagation mechanism is quantified in flux transport dynamo model uh, okay this is a, a quite a technical question uh, i do have uh, certain exposures in the generation mechanisms of the of the sunspots uh, but since i have not uh, you know given you any insight during my uh, lecture it's uh, slightly difficult for others to follow but uh, what uh, basically what jalakshmi is trying to uh, address is that inside the convection zone it is believed that um, there is a dynamo mechanism which is responsible for this magnetic field generation and the magnetic flux which is generated at the base of the convection zone it gets transported to the surface and once they come to the uh, surface then there is also a a, a migration uh, of uh, uh, and the decay of this sunspot and this sunspot decay uh, which is somewhat related to the earlier question uh, goes through a process called backpropagation and uh, for that decay process again certain parameters are are, are considered and so the diffusion is uh, one of the uh, parameter which is uh, uh, which is responsible for how fast this decay will be and so on and so forth so this is a slightly technical question jay lakshmi please contact me uh, you know personally i should be able to give you a probably longer <laughs> explanation for that then uh, harshita gandhi uh, has a question does the magnetic field in sunspot region which is kilogauss order measured using zeeman effect splitting and if yes every sunspot pair will have different magnetic field very nice absolutely right so uh, sunspots uh, uh, you know and this magnetic field measurements are done by uh, using the zeeman effect zeeman effect uh, essentially uh, it tells you that in the presence of the magnetic field a spectral line which is uh, magnetically sensitive splits and that splitting uh, is dependent on certain parameters and the landage factor and so on and if you know the which particular line you are using so you know that particular line it's it's other parameters only unknown is your magnetic field strength and uh, that's how the magnetic field is uh, is measured and you are absolutely right so uh, uh, the same zeeman effect uh, splitting is used uh, to measure the magnetic field in in different uh, uh, sunspots as well there are certain other new techniques are also coming this is called spectropolarimetry and so on and so forth through the stokes uh, vector measurements also you can get a measure of the magnetic field but th th again that's a slightly technical so i will not get into that um okay uh, the next question is uh, venika gandhi uh, as you told about sun storms which are very harmful so what may part of solar probe stay there is it safe very nice question in fact uh, this was one of the uh, one of the most challenging mission uh, nasa has ever uh, you know flown and uh, that's why it's a flagship mission in fact parker solar probe was particularly uh, designed to study these uh, uh, you know interplanetary space uh, and the solar wind and these uh, storms so the point is closer you can go you are closer to the source right but it is risky of course as you can imagine so they have dedicated 
you know instrumentation done uh, to observe this having said that they are actually not looking directly towards the sun they are looking away from the sun because they can't look at the sun they are so close to the sun that if they point their telescope directly towards uh, the sun everything will get burned although they have a huge amount of uh, you know shield and in fact the the technology uh, was actually uh, completely challenged for making the parker solar probe and these particular shields so they had uh, special uh, material science research to design those shields in front of those, those telescope but even then they are not actually looking uh, very uh, you know directly towards the sun they are looking actually particles which are coming from the sun they are trying to image uh, then when they travel between the sun and the earth line so these are called heliospheric imager there is also a coronagraph but the coronagraph is also not looking directly on the sun it will look uh, you know slightly away from the sun but as i pointed out that they will completely burn if they directly look at the sun but uh, since they are very close they are also getting a lot of heat from the sun and that uh, demands a lot of new uh, you know material science uh, development and that that was all implemented in in the parker solar probe uh, next question is uh, probably from russia is high magnetic fields in the sunspot producing active regions responsible for solar flares most likely to happen near sunspots yes that's that's correct so what happens is the complexity of the magnetic field connectivity is more severe when you have many sunspots actually i showed you much cleaner uh, examples where there was only a pair of sunspots you can have actually active region there are 30 or 40 sunspots then you think about how the magnetic field lines will be connected in this kind of complex active region and when such a complex active region evolves there are motions and so on and so forth likelihood of flares are more so flares tend to always be associated with active regions bigger flares again there are smaller flares which can happen anywhere because as i have shown you that the magnetic field is there everywhere on the sun it is just that the strongest field and the strong complexity is there in the active region but in other regions of the sun also in the quiet sun there are more many more loops they are tiny but they are also there and when these two loop system is interacting with each other there are also flares it's only that those flares are small scale flares so these are they are called micro flares or nano flares so the big flares are associated with active region and small scale flares are associated with you know non active regions uh, next question is from vishnu patel uh, temperature of corona is very high tell the most expected theory okay i have already probably indicated that uh, there are two uh, strong uh, you know competitor for this one is called the wave heating mechanism whereby we invoke that there are many uh, you know uh, possible wave uh, uh, form to be generated at the surface of the sun or higher up in the atmosphere of the sun also because of the presence of the magnetic field and the plasma and so on there are always some perturbations available so that generates the waves then the waves carry these energy to the higher layers and through some other mechanisms uh, which i will i am not dealing here detail we understand now through those mechanisms that energy can be dumped so this is called the wave heating mechanism and the other one is called the magnetic reconnection or this is again the same thing with related with the flares so there are many flares of different sizes and and scales so the big flares and small scale flares collectively provides a huge amount of energy to keep the corona at, at such high temperatures okay so there are new more questions uh, uh, reason for abnormally low solar activity right now okay so uh, i think uh, uh, the next talk my student will elaborate it uh, further and since you have this question i will encourage you to attend that lecture as well but i will very briefly mention that now we understand this dynamo uh, mechanism which is responsible for the generation of the sunspot uh, that has a, a you know cyclic behavior 
so essentially it's a wave equation if you are familiar with uh, with uh, you know wave equations then you will know that it has a, a sinusoidal uh, solutions so if you have a uh, you know a dynamo uh, a, a solution it will have a periodicity associated with that sometimes it will be responsible for generation of more sunspot sometimes there will be a, a phase where there will be less sunspots and this entire thing uh, there was earlier question on flux transport uh, dynamo that also can explain this uh, periodicity but i will encourage you again to attend the next lecture which uh, vibhuti will explain you in further detail uh, abhay pratap has a question if we generalize our understanding from the sun we should expect other stars with other convection zones to have magnetic fields but observationally several stars with outer convection zones do not show magnetic fields how can we understand the absence of magnetic field of such in, uh, field in stars with outer convection zone this is a, a good question but again mm, the the depth of the convection zone and its evolution also changes with the solar i mean with the stellar evolution so and the other question is that uh, the rotation so for the generation of the magnetic field we need both the element one is convection the other is rotation so the star also need to rotate and preferentially uh, rotate i mean differentially also mm -hmm. so unless these two combinations are correct you may not have the dynamo uh, mechanism kicked in so uh, but having said that there are many many stars now known to be magnetic and in fact they are known to be magnetic much much stronger than the sun in fact there is a, a science paper a couple of uh, weeks back where uh, it was shown from kepler observations that uh, many other stars are much more magnetically active than sun sun seems to be little peculiar so that's the title of that particular uh, science paper and i will urge you to uh, look at that uh, this is a, a paper article from the uh, from the max planck group uh, sami solanki and so on i hope that uh, answers your query a little bit okay uh, the next question is this one oh yeah how turbulent uh, turbulence conduction of heat transfer occurs in solar flare okay um it's not the turbulent conduction uh, in the solar flare or you know the flares in general is happening into the you know much higher atmosphere and there the densities are much lower so conduction is the process through which of course uh, the heat uh, transports but because of this magnetic reconnection process there are a lot of high energy particles actually which are generated they do travel uh, very fast and they carry a lot of energy as well so the conduction doesn't seem to be of course there is a ohmic uh, heating and so on so forth in the neighborhood of where the flare is but uh, uh, but other processes uh, also plays a crucial role in terms of uh, heating in flares uh, anika behta uh, what about concept of barycenter is it uh, true is this one okay oh, no sorry Uh, yeah i will not uh, because i didn't talk about uh, much of this and but i will just point out one thing is don't get too much uh, you know carried away by these kind of uh, you know there are some spurious uh, analysis people do just remember the fact that in the solar system 99.98% of the mass is actually is there in the sun okay so it's very difficult to uh, change that center of mass Uh, anywhere if if there is a small little change in any of the planets and their positions and so on okay um how can solar magnetic field actually uh, affect cosmic ray yeah okay so the question is how does uh, solar magnetic field affect the cosmic rays uh, essentially uh, as i mentioned that uh, the solar activity has a 11 year cycle the apart from this presence of this such spots and so on the global magnetic field that also has a pattern that has a, 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 a structure and so on and this global magnetic field uh, also provides a shield to some of these cosmic rays which are coming from the intergalactic medium as well along with that uh, when there are uh, more such spots 
the the overall magnetic field structure uh, of the of the sun and its neighborhood and the heliosphere is is very different it's much more complex and also it generates a lot of coronal mass ejections and so on because of the high presence of magnetic field so these uh, you know magnetic fields they uh, they basically deflect the cosmic rays which are coming from the inter uh, intergalactic space so when there is uh, not that many cmes you know the inter, uh, galactic uh, you know cosmic rays which are co coming they are not deflected they can reach earth much more easily whereas uh, uh, you know when uh, the sun is very active uh, then this uh, combination of the global magnetic field structure and also the uh, cmes they deflect a lot of cosmic rays so you see actually depletion in the cosmic ray counts in the earth does the magnetic flux tube which creates the sunspot remains connected throughout its life? Very good question. Very good question. Of course, uh, this is from Shakti Veeru Pillai. Uh, I think I mentioned this that the sunspot uh, seems to be uh, coming from the underneath the surface, and they are somehow connected, rooted inside. Now, how deeply they are rooted dictates actually how. Uh, how long these sunspots will be leaving and when it will actually uh, be also, you know, sort of responsible for a flare and so on and so forth. The other thing what happens is the complexity of the active region. If there are many sunspots in an active region, and as I mentioned earlier already, that these interactions lead to the destruction of the magnetic field because magnetic reconnection is a process where magnetic energy gets converted into heat and kinetic energy and so on. So you lose certain amount of energy from that active region and the active region eventually dies. So in this uh, way, I hope uh, it uh, answers uh, some of your uh, query. Okay, uh, Zubair Sheikh, uh, what happens to the emitted CME in interplanetary space? Okay, I will briefly answer, but uh, again, my student Ritesh will uh, give you a full lecture and show you how uh, these CMEs uh, actually propagate through the interplanetary space and depending on how the interplanetary space is the CME propagation will be dictated and also as uh, I didn't mention too much there is also something called solar wind this is a continuous expansion of the of the uh, of the solar outer atmosphere the interaction of the CME with the solar wind is again a very important uh, factor which dictates how these CMEs which propagate with the interplanetary space. So there are a lot of other uh, factors also which dictates the kinematics of the CME as it propagates into the interplanetary medium. Okay, so Onindo Dawn has a question. Why does the sunspot activity increase or decrease following a certain time interval? Okay, very good question. As I said, when you have a, uh, a, a wave equation, its solution uh, has a specific time period. Again, this is not a simple linear equation. So, strictly speaking, actually the periodicity also is not really, really constant. That periodicity is roughly 11 years. It can be between, you know, 10 years to 13 years. So there is a, a sort of a, a little bit of spread about this periodicity as well. But Again, coming back, the dynamo action is a combination of the two uh, competing forces. One is the convection and the rotation. So how the rotation and the convection is playing with each other dictates, uh, you know, these time scale as well. So these time scale are crucially, um, crucially depending, you know, what will be the period. So it's not a fixed period, but again, around 11 years, you find the solar cycle. Uh, again, uh, please attend the next lecture by Bibuti, who will talk about uh, this uh, solar cycle. Incidentally, I must also point out that from India, from our own Kodakinal Solar Observatory, we have been looking at the sun for the last 100 years. And we have been looking at sunspots, it's not me, by my predecessors, um, every day, painstakingly, early morning, taking observations. And we have digitized all those sunspot observations for more than a century. And Bibhuti is uh, doing his uh, PhD on that particular data. There have been already uh, several PhDs from that data. This data is completely public now. So if uh, students are interested, you can look at the data. You can also visit us sometime when, uh, of course, the uh, situation improves. 
and uh, you can look at this uh, sunspot data. Uh, it's it's amazing, uh, you know, information uh, we have from Kodakinol Observatory. So people can uh, look at it. Okay, so uh, this is an announcement here. If someone misses today's live lecture, they can find it on YouTube, the link of our social sites, our Facebook page, and YouTube channel. So uh, Aries uh, also has a uh, its own YouTube and Facebook channel. So please visit that and uh, you know you can go through the lecture and if you find mistakes in the lecture please point that out so that I can correct it next time as well. So uh, thank you again uh, for taking your uh, Sunday afternoon. I will be back uh, live uh, next Sunday uh, with, uh, with more excitement. Uh, yeah, so there are other lectures also in the week, uh, weekdays. Uh, next Tuesday is the next lecture. So the lecture number five will be on next Tuesday. And uh, there will be another lecture probably around Friday, and then I will uh, come back, uh, uh, you know, uh, on next Sunday. Thank you very much.